Hey, it's Pete. Welcome back to Question Christ. And tonight I wanted to delve into the new video from Prof. MTH. It's called Christianity Refutes Itself. If you don't follow Prof. MTH, uh, you're missing out because he makes very well produced, very thought provoking videos. Uh, they're, they're excellent. Um, they're going to make you think real hard about things. But uh, even though I don't agree with, with many of his viewpoints, uh, I respect his videos greatly, so check him out uh, if you haven't already. Now, Prof uh, made a, a new video, and in the video, he takes a verse out of John chapter 17. And what I want to do is I want to play the bit uh, from his video where he's talking about the uh, verse, and then we'll come back and discuss it. Then Jesus' prayer turns to the future. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one, so that the world will know that you sent me. So Prof then goes on to tell us about the 38,000 different sects of Christianity out in the world today, and the fact that the church is not united, that that is evidence uh, that Christianity is bunk and that Jesus' words are incorrect and therefore Christianity refutes itself. Or does it? What I want to do is put some context behind the passage that Prof is talking about tonight. Now this prayer that's in chapter 17 is, the, is at the very end of the Last Supper that Jesus has with his disciples. He is huddled with his scared followers he is hours away from being arrested, hours away from being crucified. And what he's doing is he's just pouring wisdom and encouragement into his disciples. He's telling them that he's going to go and prepare a place for them. That he is going to send the Holy Spirit to help them while he's gone. But he also explains to them that, that life is going to get very hard. That they're going to be persecuted and uh, that they're going to be hated. Uh, so he's, he's, he's being real with them. He's letting them know everything right now because he only has a little while left. It says in John 13 verse 1 that he realized his time had come. This was it. It's time to let them, you know, put all the cards on the table and tell them what's going to happen. Um, and then, so there's like three or four chapters where Jesus just talks. I mean, if you have a, a Bible that has Jesus' words in red, it's just red for like... <laughs> For pages, he's he's just he's the only one talking, and at the end of this of this um, kind of monologue that he gives uh, to his his followers, he prays three prayers. The first prayer is for himself. He asks God to glorify himself through the sacrifice he's going to make. Uh, that, that that God the Father be glorified by the sacrifice that Jesus makes. Two, he prays for the disciples. He, he prays the fact that, that even though Jesus is being taken out of the world, these disciples are going to remain and the church is going to be born through these disciples and to protect them so they can do what God wants them to do. And then third, he prays for future believers. And that is where we are right now in John chapter 17. Uh, so let's go there again, uh, John chapter 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone, meaning the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So people who will come to faith in Christ through the message of the disciples. That all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now back in that time, in that area, there were many so-called messiahs. Most of them were political messiahs. They were rebels. They wanted to take the Roman Empire out. Uh, and so they would come around and they'd get all these followers and there'd be this insurrection and then they'd be crushed. And some of them were crucified. But as soon as they were crushed, the movement disappeared. 
you never hear about these so-called messiahs unless you really read about them in history when you're studying this kind of stuff because no one hardly remembers their name. So Jesus here is praying that, that, that the, the disciples' words are like seeds and that they take root with the new believers. And then that will start a church that will set the world on fire with the name of Jesus. And that's what this is talking about. My prayer is not for them alone, the disciples. I pray for those who will believe in me through the disciples' message in that time to start the church that would make everyone know the name Jesus. So the question is, did that happen? Well, yes, it did. First, Jesus was arrested and all his disciples scatter. Okay, they're all like, oh, we'll go to their deaths for you. And they disappear. They abandon him. Jesus is crucified. And at best, they watch from a distance. And then they all get together. They're all terrified. And then they encounter the risen Christ. And they go from a bunch of scaredy cats, you know, Peter denying Jesus, to unstoppable proclaimers of the gospel. You find that in Acts chapter 2. After they have received the Holy Spirit in, at Pentecost, Peter preaches one heck of a sermon, <laughs> and we find out what the fruits of that sermon were in Acts chapter 2, starting verse 41. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. Now that is an altar call. <laughs> and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. Then they talk about selling their property and they're just being kind of getting all together. And then uh, at the end, in verse 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. So what this is explaining is that after Peter proclaims the gospel and 3,000 people are convicted and they and they and they and their lives are radically transformed uh, they get together and they live a radically different life and because of that change people are attracted to that seeing that that is the real deal that this Jesus must be the real deal because the radically transformed lives of their friends and their neighbors and so then they join the church as well sounds something similar to what Jesus is talking about in John 17. You also find it a little bit farther down the road as, as the church is, 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 is growing. In Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 32, actually verse 32. Now the large group of those who believed were of one heart and mind, and no one said that any of his possessions was his own, but instead they held everything in common. So again, oneness, same thing that Jesus was talking about in John chapter 17. Now, if you look at the church today, it's looking a little bit different. And so what John 17 to me is, it's not a refutation of Christianity or Jesus. What it is, is an, is an indictment of the believers of today. We should be one. We should be together. We should be living more like the, we see the followers of Jesus doing in the days right after he, he left this earth. And so this in no way refutes Christianity. What this is, is an indictment of believers and that we are bad followers and that we should be more convicted of how we live our lives.